<laughs> well, go ahead and open your song book to number 301, 301. I will sing the wonder story. Brother Ricky is going to lead us in that song. And after that, Brother Willie, would you lead our prayer for us, please? I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing, yes, I'll sing the wondrous story, the wondrous story of the Christ, of the Christ who died for me. Who died for me. Open your psalm book, or psalm book, your Bibles, to the book of Ezekiel, to chapter 25. Ezekiel, chapter 25. And if you don't have your Bible, you can grab one of the pew Bibles because we're going to um, go a little quicker tonight as we than we have been. Um, when you study the book of Ezekiel, it's a prophetic book. He was a prophet uh, during the period of time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, he paralleled the other prophets of Jeremiah and Daniel. Um, it's sort of like this, if you're looking at it, Jeremiah is with the people still in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel is with the average, everyday man uh, who's a captive in Babylon, and Daniel was in the king's palace. And so all three of them had a different message for a different audience and Ezekiel's message has been primarily that the children of Israel are in captivity because of what they did. They've been idolaters. They have been people following after the people of the land. And the fact that God was going to keep them there for a generation. Uh, they were going to be there for a period of 70 years that Jeremiah had spoken of. But as we've approached this section, beginning with chapter 25, going through chapter 32, it really changes the focus away from what the children of Israel have done to their neighbors round about them. And uh, I tried to illustrate it to you last week like this. Uh, for those of us who've got two children whose ages are not far apart, uh, if you have one of them get in trouble, what does the other one generally do? He stands on the side and snickers. 
You know, look what you got. You know, look how you've been uh, getting punished. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Well, that's what the neighbors around Israel had been doing, or particularly Judah, as they have seen God's judgment on Jerusalem and on Judah, they're just sort of like, ha, 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 you got what you were uh, supposed to get. Well, now when you get to chapter 25, last week we covered verses 1 through 14, and there he looked at the neighboring people, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites, and he pointed out how each one of them had looked with glee, happiness, joy, delight with the fall of Judah. Well, tonight we're going to pick up with verse 15. It goes through verse 17, and it will be the uh, Philistines. Now, uh, what do you know about Philistines before we ever start? Okay, I thought that's what I thought everybody would know. <laughs> okay, well... Okay. Okay, there's five cities of them. Some of them were of the giants, the Anakim. Uh, you know, Goliath was a Philistine. Goliath was about nine feet tall. Is that a pretty good sized fellow? I would say most of us would just, you know, if we saw somebody that size, we would a little bit uh, want to start backing up a step or two. Well, um, they're known for that. They're known as being bitter enemies of the children of Israel. Uh, the theft of the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, that's enough alone to have been something that would have been uh, bad. But they have been bitter enemies throughout the period of the kings. They fought against them. And uh, so here we're ready now in verse 15, reading through verse 17. Thus says the Lord God, because the Vin Philistines dealt vengefully and took vengeance with a spiteful heart to destroy because of the old hatred, therefore thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy the remnant of the seacoast, will execute vengeance on them with a furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Now, the first thing that I'd suggest that you'll notice is what he talks about in verse 15. He talked about their vengefully took vengeance with a spiteful heart. What does that tell you about these people? They hold grudges. How long have they held a grudge? What word does he describe to the, talk about that? An old hatred. Are there people who nurse grudges against other peoples? For instance, uh, a generation ago, how do you think people might would have felt from people who were from Japan? Why not? Okay, Pearl Harbor. There was a, a feeling of it. And, uh, but now that that generation of people has passed, does there appear to be a residual hatred toward Japanese people? No. But if you go to another place where the people are more indigenous, in other words, they li they've lived there for generations upon generations. For instance, if you go to the Middle East, are there people who have a hatred that goes back not one generation, not two generations, but ten generations? Yes. Do they know why they don't like each other? It's, okay. It's, it's a hatred that's been taught for generations. What's that? Jealousy? There's some of that involved of it. Well, God says, I am going to cut these people off because they have acted with this vengeance. But now notice, if you will, the middle part of verse 16, I will cut off the Carathites. That's their ethnic background. And so, well, I don't know what that means. That means they're from the island of Crete. Uh, so it's 
an area where that uh, these people have migrated from, uh, I think it was on our 2013 trip that we went to the island of Crete. Weren't you on that trip, Alan? Okay, I was, I, I was going to say I thought you were, uh, but we went to the island of Crete, and uh, when we went there, it's uh, there's a lot to be noted about. But those are sea peoples, and they migrated from there to the coastland. Do you know where the area of the Philistines is at today? There's a particular place of it. It's the Gaza Strip, uh, that whole area that's sort of a strip that's the same area where the Philistines lived. Is there still tension there today? Absolutely. There's still tension there in that same area today because of this. So God says they're going to know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. God is going to allow each of these nations to see that he is the one in charge Yes, he punished Judah, but he's saying, you also will receive your punishment for what you have done. That leads me now to chapters 26 through chapter 28. Three chapters. You really have to take all three chapters together because all three chapters are spent on one city-state the city of Tyre. Now, uh, what do you, any of you know about Tyre? It's, on, it's a coastal city. King Hiram. I'm glad Willie brought up King Hiram. <laughs> okay, so you were named after King Hiram then. Uh, well, what, was King, what did King Hiram do? Cedars of Lebanon. Where did they go to? to build the temple. So the, there was a good relationship between King Hiram and King David, and after that, King Solomon. And uh, uh, we can read about that considerably. But uh, let's begin. I want to just look at the first couple of verses or so, and I am actually going to skip some through these chapters in order to be able to cover them tonight. Verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha! She is broken, who was the gateway of the peoples. She is now turned over to me. I shall be filled. She is laid waste. First thing you'll notice in verse 1 is a time element. And uh, what do you notice is missing from verse 1? There's something missing. It's not the king, it's the month. You'll notice he always gives the month, but it's missing here. Did it fall out when one of the copyists just forgot to add the month in? I don't know. But it really doesn't matter because... What's going to happen is we will know later when it is reported when it fell. Uh, will you turn over, just keep your finger there, turn over to chapter 33 and verse 21. Chapter 33 and verse 21. I don't intend to belabor this point, but uh, we're talking about when this took place, and uh, all of this is pretty much the same time frame when Jerusalem falls and there's a siege begins, begins against Tyre. But look at chapter 33, verse 21. And it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, in the 10th month, on the 5th day of the month, that the one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. The city falls in the 11th year. How long does it take in order for the message to get to Babylon that the city of Jerusalem has fallen. About a year. We don't know exactly what month, but we know it's about a year. Now, someone says, well, why would it take a year? Why didn't they just pick up the cell phone and call and say, Jerusalem's fallen? How did you have to get the message there? Somebody had to bring that message. 
The distance from Jerusalem to Babylon is 880 miles. That's a pretty good little trek, isn't it? If you had to go 880 miles to carry a message somewhere and you had escaped Jerusalem, probably with little to nothing, how long do you think you, would it take you to get there? <laughs> It'd probably take me a year or more, uh, especially if I'm on foot. Uh, what's that? Well, it doesn't say that there's a messenger. It says one who escaped came to me. So this is not necessarily a, a messenger. This is somebody who just got out of Jerusalem who knows where the captives are, and he gets there and he says, Whew, the city fell, and it's about a year later. So that gives you a little bit of idea. But Yeah, that's, I think there's a lot, a lot of places to go to because... If you'll remember what we studied last week about the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites, and now you, we're going to talk about the people of Tyre, there's no place to go. And right after Tyre, he's going to talk about the Egyptians. So <clears throat> you remember when Jeremiah was taken captive to flee from the, uh, uh, when Gedaliah was killed, where did they go? They went to Egypt. So they're trying to find a place where they can have safety, and it doesn't appear there's any place <clears throat> that they can go. Let's look at verse 2, because to me, verse 2 is a key verse. They said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken who was the gateway of the peoples. <clears throat> Jerusalem had a reputation <clears throat> as a people that was a gateway. Now, what would you consider to be a gateway? Okay, it would be a, a trade center, and uh, people would come there. There's a significance that we'll notice, particularly when we get to chapters 27 and 28, about what kind of city Tyre was. And if one of the main trading places goes down, there's still trade going to take place, but it's going to go somewhere else. Uh, what country in the world do you suppose right now is the largest manufacturer of goods to be sold in the world? China. What would happen if China was no longer able to manufacture goods? Uh -huh. Well, I, I agree with that, but do you want me to tell you where it would go? No, it would go to, to India because you've got a large workforce there and cheap labor, and that's where it would go. That's the reason why there's a lot already there. So if one place sees another fall, they say, ah, we're going to get the business. Look at what it says in the latter part of verse 2. Now she is turned over to me, I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Tyre is looking at Jerusalem and saying, we're glad she's fallen because we're going to benefit from that financially. It's going to be a benefit for us. Well, God is going to point out their gloating is not going to do them well. Um, let me point out to you before I go any further that Tyre not only is known to Ezekiel, but Isaiah prophesied about Tyre, and you may want to write this in the margin of your Bible. Isaiah chapter 23, verses 15 through 18, talks about how that Tyre will be destroyed. Jeremiah 27, verses 2 and 3, he talks about how the city of Tyre will be destroyed. There's messengers to be sent to them as well. So, um, what is going to take place is Tyre is going to be destroyed. So let's pick up now, read verses 4 and or verses 3 through 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you, and the sea causes its waves to come up, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. 
It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, says the Lord, it shall become plunder for the nations. Now, here's some interesting things. He says, you're going to be destroyed, but it's not going to be by one nation. He said, it's going to come like the waves of the sea. Now, how do waves come in? It's like, and those waves, they just come in. He said, that's the way it's going to be. And he said, many nations are going to do that. But look at verse 4. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers, I will also scrape the dust from her. The word dust there is the word for like debris, uh, uh, the remnants of what's left over from the destruction. Now, when you read that, a lot of people say, well, that doesn't sound like it. Uh, that sounds like it's going to be an utter destruction. Well, Nebuchadnezzar came against Tyre in 585 B.C., and spent 13 years trying to destroy the city, and he did capture it, but he didn't utterly destroy it. But there's a man who came in the 300s by the name of, anybody know his name? Alexander the Great. And when he got to the city, all of the people just got in their boats, and they went out to an island, which is about a half a mile out, where a lot of people were living, and they're just sort of like, okay, Alexander, you can't come get us. You know what he did? All of the buildings and everything, he started taking. And I want you to imagine, Larry's on the back pew over here. And let's say there's water in between us. So you start taking all this debris, you put it in the, ground, or in the water. You go get some more debris, you put it in the water. And he built a causeway out of the debris for a half a mile out. And then he went out and he killed all the people on the island. And what is left on the land is nothing. That's where fishermen even today spread their nets because of what occurred when Alexander the Great destroyed the city of Tyre. And someone says, well, I see there's a Tyre on the map today. The word Tyre, the city of Tyre that's on the map today is not in the same location where this one was. Not, the, not really even the same peoples there. So, he said it'll be a place for the spreading of the nets. So this was not only fulfilled, it was fulfilled literally where that occurred. And uh, so what will begin now, uh, the rest of this talks about the villages, what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do. Verse 7, he says, I will bring against Tyre from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, with horsemen, and with an army of many people. He will slay with the sword your daughter villages in the field, all these little cities that were outside the walls. He'll direct his battering rams, verse 9. He's going to knock them all down. He said, the abundance of their horses, their dust will cover you. Their walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen. Um, I just think about the noise of all these soldiers. Talk about the dust. How much dust do you think horses could kick up if they're driving around a dusty area? And... Uh, so you can see that. He says it's all going to fall. They're going to pillage your merchandise. Uh, verse 14, again, I'll make you like the top of a rock, a place for the spreading of nets. You'll never be rebuilt. And uh, you keep going all the way through about verse 17. And they will take up a lamentation for you and say to you, how you have perished, O one inhabiting by seafaring men, O renowned city who was strong at sea, she and her inhabitants, who caused the terror to be on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands by the sea are troubled at your departure. Uh, everybody who's used to coming in there, trading it with their ships, they're all disturbed at this. And so God said, you're going to be like those who go down into the pit. And verse 21, and before we go to chapter 27, he said, I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. Though you were sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord God. And so verse, or chapter 26, is God's pronouncement of judgment upon Tyre. Then we get to chapter 27. And chapter 27 has a different flavor to it. It will be a lamentation. 
Now, we've talked about lamentations at several times before. What is a lamentation? A mourning? It's like a funeral. And when you have a funeral, people stand around and they talk, oh, we, we've lost someone. We've lost someone valuable. We've lost someone that we love. We've lost someone we care about. And there's sadness in the voice and there's despair in the voice. Well, that's what a lamentation is. Well, let's look at verse 3 and uh, really this first 11 verses. We're going to just sort of skip through them. Verse 3, and say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands, uh, first thing you'll notice, Tyre is in the perfect place to be a, a gateway. And that's the term that they had used with regards to Jerusalem. You are in a perfect position. Verse 3, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are the mist of the sea. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They made your planks of fir trees from Sinir. They took cedar from Levin to make you a mast. Of the oaks of Bashan, they made your oars. And the company of the Asherites have inlaid your planks with ivory from the coast of Cyprus. Fine embroidered linen from Egypt was what you spread for yourself. Pur blue and purple from the coast of Elisha was uh, what covered you. Now, I want to stop here for just a second when in, through verse 7. How beautiful were the ships? Well, we'll just look at one thing. Look at verse 6. The company of the Asherites have inlaid your planks with the ivory of Cyprus. What is ivory? Elephant tusk? If you inlaid the planks, the boards that were on that you walked on with ivory, would that be pretty significant? It'd be very expensive. You know, today, I don't know how many of you have ever been on a cruise, but you get on a cruise ship. How beautiful are those cruise ships? Particularly the main area of the ship. They're immaculate. They're beautiful. You know, there's all kinds of brass that's been well polished and glass and marble floors, and you're like, oh, boy, this is a beautiful place. Cost not just millions, some of them cost billions of dollars to build these ships. And uh, here he's describing the beauty of their ships, and he said, in your view, I am perfect in beauty. The oars were made from the oaks of Bashan, the best wood you could get. The masts were made from the cedars. Uh, the planks were fur stripping. The linen from Egypt was used for their sails. The picture is they went to the best places in the world to get all of the items for their ships to make them so beautiful. Now, let's begin with verse 8 because he's going through verse 11. talks about who's on the boats. Inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your oarsmen. Your wise men, O Tyre, were in you. They became your pilots. Elders of Gebel and its wise men were in you to caulk your seams. All the ships of the sea and their oarsmen were in you to market your merchandise. Uh, are there some people who seem to be more talented than others at things? Yeah, yes, there are. And if you'll notice here, he's talking about here, your oarsmen. You've got people who are more talented who are from Sidon and Arvad. And he talks about the wise people of Tyre were their pilots. The men of the elders of Gebel and his wise men caught your seams. They're good at doing that. Uh, those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung the shield and the helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Men of Arvid were your army on your walls all around. And the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung the shields on your walls all around. They made you perfect in beauty. Not only did they, were their ships outfitted with the best of people, but even their city had the army. Um, 
Are there some armies in the world that are more talented and more tenacious than others? Yes, there are. And that's what he's describing here is this city that was perfect in beauty. Do you think they might become a little bit arrogant of thinking, you know, look, look who we are, look what we have. Well, verse 12 starts a picture of their trading cargo with people. Tarshish was your merchant because of your many luxurious goods. What do you mean, Tarshish? Spain? You know what comes from there? Gold and silver. You know, were precious metals. He said, they gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead for your goods. Jabal, Tubim, and Meshach were your traders. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. When you look at verse 13, were there slaves? When you bartered with human lives? Verse 14, those from the house of the Torgama trade your wares with horses, steeds, and mules. Talking about the beast of burden, the animals. The men of Deden were your traders. Many isles were in your market of your hand. They brought you ivory, tusk, and ebony as payment. Syria was your merchant because of the abundance of the goods you made. They gave you for your wares emerald, pearls, embroidery, fine linen, corals, and rubies. Judah and the land of Israel were your traders. They traded with your merchandise, wheat, mennonith, millet, and honey, and oil, and balm. Damascus was your merchant because of the abundance of your goods. And you made because of your many luxury items with the wine of Helbon and with white wool. Dan and Javan paid your wares, traversing back and forth. Wrought iron, cassia, and the cane were among your merchandise. You see, going all the way through verse 24, He's just listing one country after another and the things that they traded with. Uh, if I ask you what country today is very prominent in, uh, tech, uh, just say, technology, uh, I'm thinking more in electronics. Where do most of our electronics come from? Southeast Asia, which would include China, Vietnam, Korea, uh, that's where the majority come, and you have to see that's where these are coming from as well. Well, picking up with verse 25, going through verse 36, he said, the ships of Tarshish were your carriers of your merchandise. You were filled with and very glorious in the midst of the sea. Your oarsmen brought you many waters, but the east wind broke you in the midst of the seas. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and pilots, your caulkers, your merchandisers, all your men of war who were in you and the entire company which is in your midst will fall in the midst of the seas on the day of your ruin. What picture do you get here of all of their wealth? Wouldn't mean anything, but... Uh, one of the things that I, I like to watch on some of the uh, channels, and Coretta can tell you this is something I watch a lot, like the History Channel, or where they talk about these ships that go down, the, the Spanish galleons, and what are they constantly searching for? Gold and jewelry and stuff such as that. And they're trying to find them because Spain had many, many, many of these ships that were just full of riches. And many of them went down in storms. You know, uh, the picture he's trying to give here is your beautiful ships, all this stuff you're trading, what, where's it going to go? It's going to sink. And uh, you're not going to have access to it anymore. And he talks about the common land will shake, all the horror, uh, handle the oar, the mariners, pilots in the sea will come down from their ships and will stand on the shore. They will make their voice uh, heard because of you. They will cry bitterly. They'll cast dust on their heads. If you're a sailor and you're the captain of the ship and you look out there and the ship that you're fixing to take over that's coming into port sinks and it's got all the stuff on it, how do you feel? Stomach drops because you're out and you're not only going to not be able to sell that ship, you've lost your job. Everybody who traded with Tyre was going to be grieving because of Tyre's loss. 
And so he tells in verse 31, give themselves with sackcloth, gird themselves with sackcloth, weep for you, bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. Uh, they're going to take up because this city has been destroyed in the midst of the seas. Verse 36, the merchants among the peoples will hiss at you. You will become a horror and be no more forever. Not only have we lost our job, they're gone. They're gone. That leads me to chapter 28. Chapter 28, in my judgment, is one of the most misused chapters in the book of Ezekiel. One reason is because people look at this chapter and say, that's the devil. That's the origin of Satan. That along with Isaiah chapter 14, they will say, this is a description of the devil. But I want to begin, first of all, and notice a few things as we start beginning with verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to thee, Prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted, and you say, I am a God, I sit in the city of the gods, in the midst of the seas, you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as a heart of a God. How do you think the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, thought about himself? He thought, I moved into Godhood. Are many leaders smitten with this idea of Godhood, that they're somehow above humankind, that they're even deserving of worship and things such as that? Well, drop down with me to verse 6. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? But you're a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now, uh, he said, when a guy comes to you and he starts slaying you, are you going to say, I'm a God now? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to recognize your own frailty as a person. And really going through verse 11, that is the view, I'm perfect in beauty, I'm a God, I'm leading all this. Now let's pick up with verse 11 because it's going to deal with the response here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the... I want you to see that again. King of Tyre... And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. It's the sardis, a topaz, a diamond, the beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were anointed uh, were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now I'm going to stop there. Some people say, well, that's talking about the devil. When the devil was created, he was created good, but he fell, his arrogance, his pride. But I want you to notice verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. Within you sinned, and I cast you. This is not talking about the devil. This is talking about the prince or king of Tyre and God's judgment on him. And so he wants them to see that they are getting what they deserved. I did not get all the way through verse 19, 
But I think you got the picture, and that's where we'll pick up, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. and we do invite you to be back with us at any and every opportunity that you can. Tonight's scripture reading will be taken from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The first song tonight is number 886, or 886. The invitation song is number 760. The youth group is reminded that tonight following the service is, will be birthday Wednesday. Those I have on the, on the sick list. And our fall festival here at Bobby's is scheduled for November the 5th. There's further details in the bulletin, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for those that wants to bring food. <clears throat> Sing hallelujah to the Lord.
bow as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for the ability for us to gather together on the middle of the week to take time to focus on your word, to recharge our spiritual batteries so that we can go throughout the rest of the week to be able to be the best Christians that we can. Father, please be with each person here. Help them to pay attention to the message. Keep the worldly things out of our minds for just a few minutes so that we can focus on the message that is given and apply that to our lives as we go throughout the rest of this week. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm reading from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I would imagine that practically everybody knows John 3.16. We probably don't quote John 3, 17 as much as we ought to with that because it says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That wasn't the reason why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to provide condemnation. He came to provide salvation. He came to provide man a way, a means, and directions to make it to heaven. He said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Many people have misunderstood John 3.16, though. They've looked and said that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they have walked away and they said that's all it really takes is just believing in Jesus. Well, I invite you to look earlier in John chapter 3 because John, in writing this letter, wants us to understand all of what Jesus said during this period of time and what led to this was his conversation with Nicodemus back earlier in the chapter. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of the water and the Spirit. Well, again, doesn't take much study, even a little bit further, to keep reading. If you go to John 3 and verse 22, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. You see, a part of the Lord's teaching was very plain and very clear. That was for a person to be baptized as well as to believe on him. And that's exactly what he said in the Great Commission in Mark 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. You see, what God is looking for is people who will trust that Jesus is his son and who will repent of their sins because of their confidence, their faith in him, that he will, they will do what he says to do. But that ultimate act of submission is when a man submits to being baptized for the remission of his sins. It's possible tonight that we've got someone here who wants to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by being baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you do, we're going to sing this song of encouragement for you to come forward and say, let me be baptized. I want to do what Jesus said to do. I want to do it why Jesus said I ought to do it. And if you're here tonight and you're a child of God and you need to be uh, restored, you need prayers for the mistakes you've made, we'll be glad to assist with that as well. Would you come as we stand and sing? Jesus, standing for the right, holding up his hand in the faith is listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am 
Father, we're so thankful we've had this opportunity to come together midweek to study your word. Father, we're mindful of those who are not able to be with us. Mindful, Father, also of those who've lost loved ones and pray that you would be with them in these times of hardship and pray, Father, we might do those things we can to help them through their time of struggle. Father, we're thankful of all the blessings we have in this life. We're thankful of Jesus, the opportunities that he's afforded us to be able to live on this earth and strive to go to heaven and hope, Father, that we would live our lives each day in a way that would be pleasing to you. And after this life, you would be able to give us that home that's promised to us. Please forgive us, Father. Help us through the rest of this week. Pray that you would be with us as we go on to our homes and our different places. Help us to be safe. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.